Uh, let's do this in, uh, in English. Uh, so everybody, I think, here in this audience has some way or another device at home which is sort of connected to the, the internet and, and thus IoT live stuff by monitoring or, or, or controlling or something. Uh, and we always have this 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 weird feeling of uh, hey, is this is this is this going to be safe? Is this going to be safe for my grandmother? Uh, is is there not 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 stuff leaking or or, or, or weird things going on? So uh, Joyce and her team uh, at uh, at the Hanzo Home School have uh, come up with a project that is a simple but uh, very efficient firewall just for IoT applications, and she's going to present it uh, to us. So take it away. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you for being here today. It's uh, exciting to speak here for, uh, for the first time. Uh, yes, oh, sorry, I'll speak a bit louder. Sorry, is this uh, better in the back? Yeah, the mic is just for recording, so I need to get a separate one. But Is this audible enough, or? Yeah? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, so I will be talking about the firewall itself. I'll be talking a bit about the design of that and about the, um, about the ideas behind it and about the technical uh, components because I had to talk about it a few times or I got to talk about it a few times but never actually about the technical bits so I'm going to take this opportunity to do so. Um, but also I want to talk a bit more broadly about consumer security, right? Because Rudy also already said it, uh, you all probably have some, you know, fun internet stuff at home and you can think about how you want to, you know, how you want to use those and if you are concerned about the data usage or not. But most people don't, right? Uh, so that's kind of what I want to talk about. How do we think about security for, for those people? Um, First a bit about myself. Um, as Rudy said, my name is Joyce Mellens. I'm 27. I am a teacher at the Hans Hochschule in Groningen. I teach networking security and a bit of systems architecture there. Uh, I actually teach at the same where I did my own bachelor, which is very fun because that I get to talk with my uh, then teachers, now colleagues, and we get to I was really good and great at everything. <laughs> Uh, it's very nice. Um, at the same time, I also have the opportunity to work in our research team. So uh, during that, I've been working on, well, on CARE, on the firewall. I've been working with students on uh, extending it and doing lots of fun projects with them, which is really nice. And uh, I've been doing that for over, a little over two years now, and I've done that part-time to switch to also continuing my, continuing my own education at the uh, U of S OS3 program. I think some of you might be familiar with that. I see some people nodding. Uh, so that's kind of what I do in, uh, for, for a living most of the time. Um, but what did I do that's you know, so fun that I decided to come over here and, uh, and talk about it? Um, well, in 2019, I was finishing up my bachelor's and I was looking up for a pro uh, project to do. And one I saw was for the, uh, I'm going to read how I translated this, the Northern Innovation Hub for the Dutch Police, uh, Innovatie Huis Politie in Nederland. They have a really nice setup where anyone who works for the police, they can, they have an idea, they drop it in the idea box, and then the Innovation Hub, they, they, uh, they get an intern to build it, which is really nice. And they had an idea for an IoT firewall for consumers, and I was like, that's interesting, because what we did in my and what I think most programs rightfully focus on is, is a lot of enterprise stuff, right? Lar large systems, large administrative systems. Uh, and of course, that's, that's going to be the most valuable thing to focus on. There's a lot of stuff to learn there. Um, but how, how do we think about building something for consumers, right? How do you build a system when there isn't an expert to actually manage it? How do you set that up? So that was an interesting question. And that's kind of what got me going and thinking about how, uh, how do we build a firewall just for consumers? Um, so what I want to do is first I want to talk a little bit about the background about it, about, uh, behind it, about you know, thinking about security for consumers, um, a little bit about IoT landscape, I don't think I need to tell a lot about that, and then I want to get into the, the technical details of the program itself. So first, why IoT? Well, IoT is kind of obvious, right? There's up the figure specifically for today, but I think the most recent ones, it's 10 billion worldwide and counting. 
Um, some of those are going to be industrial. In fact, a large part of them are industrial IoT. That's a whole other ball game, honestly. There's not even really the same thing. Um, but a lot of them are consumer oriented. And a lot of those are still, most of them are concentrated in developed nations. So you're going to see a lot of people with multiple devices in, them, in their own, in, um, in, their own uh, in a single house. And it makes sense, right? They're relatively easy to set up at the time. They have very neat features. Um, it's, it's kind of like the perfect you know, modern toy for adults, or sometimes the perfect modern adult toy. Um, but they're not, they're, they carry actually pretty important sensitive data, you know, video footage, audio recordings, payment information, caveat medical data nowadays is under more stringent, uh, you know, laws than, than most other devices. But it's, it's personal data, and normally, you know, we store that larger businesses and we kind of assume they have the money and the expertise to, to you know, protect it. Consumers, we just say, all right, here you go, here's your, your, all your stuff is on it. Make sure you keep that safe, all right? Good luck. And, you know, that shouldn't come as much as of a surprise that that goes wrong, right? Like, there's a lot of these devices out there. Consumers don't know much about what to do with them. And, you know, there is valuable stuff on there. Um, and, you know, hoping that users do the right thing, it's, it works a lot of the time, but it also doesn't work, right? I'm sure a lot of you deal with the fallout of that all of the time. Um, I mean, right, we're not going to run out of technical challenges anytime soon, right? But how many of the, the larger breaches recently have been due to human error, right? Someone that opened the wrong file, that had a crappy password, or that, um, I don't know, got fished or whatever. And same kind of problem. Or, sorry, for consumers. Right? Uh, in this world of you know, specters and heart bleeds and, I don't know, Pegasus spyware kits, I'm not sure about the numbers for, for industrial. I'm not going to speak on that. But for consumers, the vast majority of breaches are just because of that one unsquashable bug, which is just simple human error. Right? So that's the problem. Um, how do we deal with that? Um, and that is a big problem, right? Because users just aren't doing what we need them to, right? We need users in order for their stuff to be safe. We need them to do some things. We need them to set up their devices properly. We need them to configure them right, properly, get, give them secure passwords, right? Or even just change the default, which most people don't do. And um, it's a big problem because every design has to have um, and that's not a huge problem for functionality, right? If we need a user to push a button to turn on the lights, they'll, they'll learn it, right? They'll just, as long as they, get, they push enough random buttons, eventually they find the one that turns on the lights and they, they've learned their lesson. Security doesn't have that kind of feedback. Users don't learn by doing, and we shouldn't expect them to take classes on it, right? Uh, it's not like when a user types password 123 on their keyboard, they instantly receive a shock, although, <laughs> maybe they should. That's, maybe that's a talk for next year. See how, see how that works. You know, they don't learn by themselves, and they're something that we should expect. Them. Why do we still have systems where we expect them to, uh, to, where we keep on expecting them to? All right. So, well, what do we do about the users, right? What do we do about this this problem that all these nice systems that we build? People have to use them. It's just, can't we just put them somewhere nice? Well, one school of thought is that if we can't get rid of the user, then we have to make the user better, right? So we can set up um, phishing training programs. We send out awareness emails about how to spot scammers or um, set up awareness campaigns about how to pick a good password. And I've read some statements from uh, companies that set up phishing trainings, and they say it works wonders. And as far as I mean, credit to that credit to them as far as I could find numbers on the efficacy of, of awareness training. It does seem to be helping and certainly, you know, like helping people be aware of phishing emails certainly can be making things worse, but clearly it hasn't solved the problem either. All right? So awareness is going to help, but it hasn't really solved it. And for their own consumer stuff either, right? Like that's not an option, even if it did work perfectly great tool in the box trying to use is that we can make our design better right we can look at 
user interaction. We can look at how do we communicate the things you want to users, right? And a perfect example, you may have heard of this, is about the B-17 bomber. Has anyone heard about the story of the design of this thing? I see, if, yeah, I see a few hands. Um, so the B-17 bomber, I don't know much about airplanes, to be completely honest, but I'm told it was a very, very nice plane. A lot of bomby things in the war, and a lot of people, I think Wikipedia said it was the, what was it, is the uh, third, yeah, the third most, third most built bomber in the world, which is, that's, that's quite a lot. And you know, whether how many exactly was built isn't the point. The point is it was popular. A lot of people uh, liked and used the airplane. But it had a pretty bad rep. And despite being known as a really, really good plane, it also crashed a lot. It crashed when landing. Because what would happen is pilots would be approaching the runway, and then they would crash. Like they wouldn't put out the landing flaps, but instead they would just descend and hit the ground. And people weren't sure why this was happening. You know, people uh, blamed the, the of the planes. People blamed the pilots for just being bad apparently, or poor training. And there was a lot of back and forth about why are these planes crashing. And so here's a photo of the inside of the cockpit. And you see two buttons that are outlined there. Uh, the left button is the button that you use to put your landing gear up or down. And the right button is the one that puts your flaps down, or up. So if you press the left button, that's good. You're going to land. Everything's fine. If you press the right button, you crash. <laughs> They're the same button. <laughs> They're next to each other. So what, you know, obviously what, you would have, what would happen is you have pilots. They come back from bombing runs. Like It's the middle of the night. They may have been out there for 12 hours, nonstop action. And then the final moment, as they're like just dozing off, they have to push one of these buttons, and they often push the wrong one. <laughs> now, thankfully, uh, airplane designers have learned from this, and nowadays you see the knobs actually are just even built entirely differently. Right? So the thinking of how do we make sure that who's, the person who's using this plane always knows which button to press um, is just a very important thought process. And this kind of thing, obviously, we do this more and more, uh, even outside of airplane design as well. Um, and UX design is, is obviously a big part of the picture for uh, consumer security and for, for just security in general, right? Making sure that uh, users know which knobs they should be pushing. Uh, we had a phishing training at, uh, at the Hanzo School a few weeks ago. And uh, I didn't bother doing much with it because I saw someone else already reported it, so I'm like, it's fine. Um, but I did notice that in, in my mail client, I, uh, in the web client for Outlook, there was no button to report it, because I tried it a little bit, but then you know, it was too much effort, and I kind of gave up. And I did see one big button that says, oh, hey, do you want to load all the JPEGs and everything in this email? But I couldn't find a button to report it as spam, which is just, apparently we haven't learned enough from the, from the bomber crashes, right? What, we should, what buttons should we prioritize for users? What should we let them press first? Um, so yeah, this is a big part of it. This is going to help a lot, but it also hasn't solved the problem yet because we're still trying to guide users down the right path, but expecting them, hoping that they'll just do it. So what I would say is that what we should do instead, or not instead, but alongside it, it's never going to be just one solution, is reduce our reliance on the user. I think the issue is actually that we expect a lot from people that they can't always deliver on. Now, I know where I'm at. I'm, I haven't forgotten my audience. I'm not saying we should lock down everything and make sure people can't do with their devices whatever they want to do with them. I'm not saying we take the steering wheel out of the car. I'm just saying that when people approach the car, we say, here you go, here's the passenger seat. And if they want to drive, we just let them you know, move over and drive. But we invite them for the passenger seat first. You know, let people make the decision to take control if they want to but don't give it unless asked. And you know, that kind of thing goes double for consumers. Right? Like it's, it's important for, uh, for users in, in corporate environments, but if you're a consumer you're on your own, and the only tech support you have is your nephew, who's sometimes available and comes over every few months, it's just you have way less support. Right? You, can't, you don't have a knowledge database. You don't have people to ask. Um, so when it comes to building things for, for, for consumers, 
we really need to keep in mind what can we expect from users. Now I'm going to talk about the IoT firewall that we built. And when I initially started this project, the first thing I did was I looked up what other solutions exist. And when I looked around, I found a lot of really great solutions. I found a lot of really great products. I'm not going to stand here and say that the thing I built um, is the only great thing and the rest is all crap. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that have extra, better features, do some things better, or even just have more effective security measures. But a big flaw that I noticed with most of them is that you just, you kind of needed to know how to use them, right? Like, I'm not saying that they're poorly designed or inherently intuitive. You know, I'm, I'm willing to say with confidence that any of my students, let alone anyone in this room, could pick up any of them and install them, you know, with ease. That's a pretty high bar to set, though, right? Like, this room, absolutely, my students too, right? IT students, they're already pretty into it. Um, there's a lot of people who are much less confident about handling things. And when it comes to security, I think it's kind of like, uh, like with a diet or a workout program, right? Like the best security is the one that you actually implement. Because no matter how good it is in theory, if you, don't, you can't actually you know, get it to work in practice, it doesn't really much. Let's see, all right, got ahead, got ahead of myself a little bit there. Uh, yes, so what do I think then is part of the solution? It's more simplicity, right? Making things even sim simpler for users as much as we can, trying to get rid of as much needed interaction. Again, don't take out the steering wheel, but make the default path that users take have as few knobs that they need to turn as possible. Uh, and that's kind of going to lead into the you know, design of the firewall. Right? This is the main inspiration that I wanted to start from. I wanted to make this thing as low interaction as possible. The idea is for users to get a box, plug it in, and be done. Um, and let's see. I'm actually going a, lot, going a decent bit faster. Uh, but that's okay. It makes better too quickly than too slowly. Um, yes, so CARE itself. The idea, IoT firewall for consumers. And just first things first, give you a bit of an idea of, of what we're looking at. Here's a schematic diagram of just a ran, random home network. Uh, I've blown up the ISP modem gateway router access point combo box into three bits, uh, which just makes it a little bit easier to see. At least I think it makes it easier to, to look at. Uh, the top you have just the you know the the modem router copy that just goes outside the house, and the left you have the access point, and the right is this the uh, is the Ethernet ports of the of the box. And you see some uh, some IoT devices, you know, a smart thermometer and a camera, and you see a, a laptop and a smartphone connected. To this. this is the kind of network that we're uh, that I you know ideally like to work in. But in order to be the firewall, a firewall. We ideally want to be right here, right? We want to be at the gateway. We can't actually filter any traffic if we're not in the middle of the traffic. And that's kind of a problem because one of the things that um, we originally wanted to do, and that's the one of the things that the police actually were, or not the police, the, the person within the organization that really wanted this, was really a fan of this project, one of their biggest demands, and, and I ended up agreeing with it, was that we don't replace the home gateway. You know, we don't put, the, put it into, into bridge mode and put a router behind it. We don't put it, uh, we don't replace it, which wasn't legal at the time yet. I think a few years, a few months or years ago, um, there was a new law that says that, you know, people are allowed to actually replace their modem, thankfully. Uh, but that wasn't even legal at the time yet, so that wasn't even supported. Um, but if we ended up replacing it, users have to reconnect all their devices to the Wi-Fi, which for IoT can be a pain. And more importantly, this was a one-man project for six months. If I ended up having to build a router and compete with everything that's in the router space available currently, uh, that, that was going to be a bit too ambitious. So what we decided to settle on, what, well, not settle, but what I do think is the better solution, what we decided to do instead is this. We siloed it. It's a simple box, and you connect it to the existing gateway over, uh, over Ethernet, and that's where it does its job. 
Now there's a problem with that. Um, I think you guys can spot it. Traffic's not going to go there, is it? It's just a little box on the side. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to be able to filter anything. So this was the biggest. Pro this was one of the biggest challenges in the beginning, and it took me a while to to figure this out. But it turns out the solution is actually relatively simple because why do all, does all this traffic, you know, go straight through the gateway outside? Well, okay, it's the shortest path, but. The only reason that knows it's the shortest path is they've been told it's the shortest path, right? They've been told that if you want to go outside to the internet, you've got to contact the gateway, right? You have to contact that box up there. So what I could do instead is I take over DHCP, right? Because DHCP is what's telling all the devices where they need to go in order to leave the network. So that's what I do. When the user can compare to the network, they are asked to provide the username and password of the gateway, what I'm hoping to do in the future is we'll probably get a student on this if we can make it big enough of a project, is with OCR, instead just ask them to uh, take a picture of the back of the existing gateway and then they don't need to figure out what, what the password for the Wi-Fi is and what the password for the actual router is because it's two different ones, right? Um, but the user you know, gives the credentials, care signs into the gateway, changes the uh, IP addresses, that are on the, the LAN side, it turns off DHCP, and then it just segments, or sorry, it restructures the local network so that all the traffic flows, uh, flows through care. And what we do while we're there is we do a little bit more because you know, we can tell traffic to go to us, but that doesn't solve everything just yet. Uh, what we do as well is I restructure it like this. Uh, you can see we use the entire 10.0.0 slash 8 space for the, for the home network, which okay, may be a bit overkill, but um, it's fine. I don't think, these, I don't think they're going to expand. There's not going to be a new department in the house, so I think we'll be okay. Um, so we use that for the home network, and then I have three different main subnets. There's one for uh, regular devices, uh, which is the point one. We have one for quarantine, and quarantine is for... Um, when new devices come in, we don't know what it is yet. We don't know where to place it, whether regular or with IoT devices. Uh, and also it's something to consider for, hey, IoT resale is also a thing. What if something's compromised the moment it comes in? Right? So that's kind of where it starts. And then we have another slash 16, which is the subnet space for IoT devices. Uh, I call it a subnet space but it, because it contains another 256 uh, slash 24 networks for each individual IoT device. And the reason for that is that this way, each, in, each individual IoT device is again segregated into its own little network, and the only way it con can contact anything locally is by going through the firewall, by going through care. Um, could have used another you know, size of a network rather than slash 24, but I figured 256 devices locally is quite a lot for a user's home. I mean, maybe I'm going to run into the same problem that you know, the people who made IPv4 uh, run into, but I believe I'm right this time. Um, so that's the, that's the idea, right? They're in their own networks. And then you get something that looks a little bit like this. You can see in blue are the, uh, the data flows for regular devices and they're most In fact, they are interrupted. IoT devices, they need to go through the firewall. They can go basically anywhere else. And this is very useful because now this means not only can we intercept traffic that's going outside, but also anything local. And that really gives us all the control we need to be a Except it doesn't. Not yet. Um, there's one more problem that we have with this design, and that's that because even though we're now the gateway for all IoT devices, when they send something to the internet, it's going to go to the firewall. That one's going to send it out to the gateway. And then incoming traffic will come back in by the gateway. And by necessity, the gateway has to be in this overarching slash 8 network, right? Because it has to see everything else. And so what happens when it sees a packet that's destined for, for this network? It sees, oh, I know where that is. I'm going to send it right there. It's just going to take the shortest path, which is going to then bypass my firewall again entirely. So I can't actually inspect return inbound traffic, which is kind of a problem because that's a lot, lot of the traffic, the part that's coming. 
Um, so how do we solve that? Well, the so solution for that was actually relatively simple. It's just a single rule in IP tables. But um, I think the network engineers in the room may not. The solution is NAT. Well, <laughs> <laughs> NAT. So that means the traffic coming in, any traffic coming out from my device it goes to the firewall, where then it's NATed to that firewall's IP address. It goes back out, where it's NATed again to go onto the internet. Um, oh, and the, 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 the result this has to go to the firewall, and it goes back. Um, double NAT may not be the most elegant solution. But my, my argument is that anyone who knows enough about networking to be bothered knows enough about their own and home lab that this probably, this automated network segmentation probably isn't there. You know, they're not target demographic, I think. Uh, so that's my excuse. Plus it does work, actually, so that's really nice. Until it doesn't. Until it does. <laughs> that's true for most things. So you get a situation that's, that's kind of like this, right? So you see that the, uh, you see the regular devices in blue are in the, uh, the same overarching slash 16. You have the gateway and the firewall in the main <coughs> slash zero, and you have the, the, sorry, the slash eight network. Um, and you see each of the IoT devices, the therm uh, thermostat and the camera are both in their own little slash 24s. And any traffic that really wants to go out couldn't find a way to make this as pretty as I wanted to, but I think it's clear enough. Any traffic that wants to go out, uh, it will be routed through the gateway at some point, but it doesn't go outside until it's passed through the firewall. And at that point, we're finally actually ready to start doing the security part, because now all we've got is just a place to start filtering traffic. We haven't started filtering yet. I have a nice clock here, but it has turned entirely the wrong way. There we go. There we go, we're pretty good for time. All right, um, obviously from here we can do some pretty basic things. Um, turns out a lot of IoT devices ship with SSH or Telnet still enabled from debugging, so that's a pretty easy thing to block, but not very exciting. Um, again, a lot of those kinds of block rules are, um, they're, they are optional, right? There are advanced settings that you can turn <coughs> things off if you want to, but the idea is, the target audience is people who are, you know, they do like tech things a little bit. They like the idea of having a fridge that orders milk when it runs out. You know, they like the idea of controlling their thermostat from outside the home, but they don't know about, you know, dealing with networks. They don't know about security. They don't know what SSH is, let alone use it. So the idea is just we block as much stuff by default for them. And then you know, if you end up setting it up for yourself, you can always change it if you want. All right, so what are the things that we do then for security? Well, first things, I have to look at, you know, what am I going to be concerned with mostly, right? What is the big threat actor that we are concerned with? Uh, again, it's a one-man, six-month project, so I was going to have to focus, and I thought I'm probably not going to be able to beat the NSA in six months on my or maybe ever, probably. Very smart people. So that was a bit risk for, for users, and well, it says it there, botnet herders. Botnet herders are, at least, the absolute vast majority of attackers for consumer IoT. And that's very significant because the economics of being a botnet herder makes, your, makes it that you only have really one kind of attack that you can use. I mean, automated maybe, but remote for sure. The economics for botnets don't work out. You have to drive around the world individual devices, although maybe we'll see something with drones becoming cheaper, right? If you can get drones in the air multiple places, this might change. But automated for sure as well, right? Again, the economics don't work out if you had to have to put too much of your own effort into this. Uh, then what type of attack? Well, you see it there. Sometimes they do use uh, you know, zero days for specific devices. You see this occasionally, I believe, most recent one I've I read about was a uh, was for like a, a TiVo system, like a like a recording system for TVs. It was a zero day in that, and hacked a bunch of those in one go. Uh, that does happen, but for the most part, at least by volume, it's credential stuffing, which is a bit sad because then my you know your big project is people don't change the default password. How do I please fix that? And like we said, like I said, you can ask them, but apparently asking doesn't work. 
So we had to figure out another thing. So credential stuffing, bad user set password, that's still the main threat. So it's the most effective thing we focus on. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so this is our main focus, botnet herders. Uh, we're not going to try to protect against state actors or, or highly targeted attacks, right? We have to look at what the, what the most bang for the buck is that we can get. Uh, do, do, do. Let's see. Yeah, so for the credential stuffing, right? Our, our problem is that users aren't setting the right password and we see immediately that's the same problem we were talking about earlier. Right, users just aren't doing the thing we rely on them uh, to do. Right, the idea is they get a they get a device. It's secured with a password. We expect them to set a password. They're not doing the thing we expect, or the problem is that we're expecting them to do it. So maybe we can fix that. How can we make uh, longer rely on the user setting a password? Uh, that's obviously a bit of a problem when we can't change the device itself. So I'm thinking, what what can we do? Well, normally one of the ways to compensate for you know users losing their passwords or, ha or having bad passwords is you use 2FA, right? That's, that's two-factor authentication. That's the normal way you would go about this. But going back to the best security is the one you implement, if I sell people a box that says, hey, you remember how nice it is to use your thermostat? Yeah, you have to use the do the pin thing that you do at work. And it's self, right? So, I decided to put a little twist on it. I wanted to reduce the amount of things that users have to do, and I decided, why not automate it? How about we see if we can automate it? So what, the, what we do is, alongside the firewall, it's inside the box. Users can find app on their mobile phone or laptop. Um, and that does have some, you know, some, some options for local config as well, which is not as interesting. Uh, but remotely, it has a small background service that just Every now and then, it sends a small keep alive packet. And it just t sends a small packet to the router and it just says, hey, this is where I am. This is my current IP address. Just so you know, this is where I am. All right, and you can let traffic from this address through. And that goes obviously on top of usual authentication in the device itself, right? So that's kind of where the, the multi-factor comes in. So normally everything that's coming in is blocked unless it's associated with, a, uh, with an outgoing, an ongoing connection or if it's from a device that's been whitelisted because it, you know, it's sending the keep alive messages. Uh, this looks a little bit like that. It uh, sorry, looks a little bit like this. So the client sends a message to the server and it's a very small single packet sent over TCP because we, we don't want to lose it. Um, and inside that packet there is the IP address of the client. It's the public, the, the actual, not the local one, the pub, the, the uh, you know, there's the global IP address of the client and the timestamp of when it was sent. And it's encrypted with a pre-shared key that is shared during setup. Um, and then the idea is that in order to prevent against, you know, to prevent someone from just capturing the packet and sending it, sending it back later to re-authenticate an expired address, you know, we have the timestamp to check for that. And if someone wants to capture the packet and send it back from another, you know, from their own IP address or tamper with it, um, we, have the, we check the IP address in the encrypted payload. We can check that against the source IP to verify that it is actually coming from the right place. Um, now, obviously, this isn't foolproof, right? If I go to a coffee shop, if you follow me, follow me around and you wait for me to go to a coffee shop and you, know, you set up next to me in the same coffee shop, um, I'm going to send the Keep Alive packets and I'm going to whitelist just the entire coffee shop for you, right? You can just sit next, next to me and, and get into my devices that way. But for that, we're, we go back to the threat profile, right? We said we have our main threat, threat actor is botnet herders, right? They have to do remote automated attacks. And the scale of it just doesn't work out if you have to follow individual people to the coffee shop in order to, get, to break into their devices, right? So for the actual threat profile, this work ends up working quite well. Let's see, are we for time? Here we're pretty good. Um, yeah, so these rules, obviously, they're only temporary, right? They, they run out after a few minutes, and what you have is you have one system listen, listening for incoming messages. Oh, that's good. Um, and you have another one that checks, hey, is anything expired? And it chucks it out. Uh, does it all stick together? Um, I think, actually, it's, it's decently neat, um, at least 
I'm, I'm a bit proud of it. Um, the idea is that beyond trying to provide you know, a simple solution for people who aren't very techy, uh, we also wanted it to be open source and we wanted it to be extensible. extendable. So what you have is you have a, a, a core in Python that keeps state and that interacts with the actual services that you know, do the firewall blocking, that, that do the DHCP restructuring. And the idea is that the core is actually relatively extensible. You can just, you know, you can add new functions, you can add new pipes and outputs relatively straightforwardly and the client app as well. So it's quite easy to add new commands, to add new features. Um, because that's just something we wanted to add as well. Um, one other thing though, that might be a problem, maybe I've noticed, open source is really great, right? It's really cool stuff. But my grandmother doesn't know what the word compiling means. And that means it's very hard to actually get it to her. So it's actually quite a, it was quite a funny experience. Originally, like I said, I made this for the, for the Innovatie Huis Politie Noord Nederland. Um, I wish they had a shorter name, it'd be easier to pronounce it, talks, but... Uh, if that scares you off, by the way, like I said, it is open source, so you can just check nothing is stored other than, you know, the state, and nothing is sent. Um, though the code has been obfuscated through having been written by me, um, but I'm, I'm sure you can, you can, <laughs> you can work with that. Um, no, so they originally they, they you know asked for me to uh, you know to work on this and they actually really liked the result. We were very happy with it. They were very excited about it. And then they looked at each other and said, "Wait, we can't sell things. We're the police. We, what are we going to do with it?" And so they were actually a little bit sad because what are we going to you know what are we going to end up doing with it? Uh, thankfully, we were able to transfer the rights uh, because despite being made open source, there are some weird things with with rights going on still. Uh, to the Cybersecurity North, Net North Netherlands program. Uh, and in cooperation with the Hans Hochschule, what we're doing right now is we're you know, having students do internship programs on developing extra features, but we also are working together with the Hans's uh, entrepreneurship program to get a multidisciplinary team of students to actually work on, on marketing it and bringing it to market. So that's the idea of how we're trying to combine uh, both research and marketability without having to become a commercial entity ourselves. And I think that's about, yeah, that's about time. That's about what I wanted to talk about. So about the, you know, the design of the consumer design and the technical parts here as well. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And uh, we have seven minutes for questions, if there are any. Thank you. Uh, do you want uh, do you, uh, do you handle that? Yeah. Is Karen an acronym or? No, it was originally actually inspired by, uh, let's see, by a, a local board sports because I needed a name. I was like, oh, Kara, that sounds fun. And then I looked it up and apparently it's Welsh for fortress. So I thought, oh, that's such a clever name. <laughs> that's such a cool name. So it means fortress in Welsh. Yes. Uh, you talk about the people I, um, but that means that it needs some kind of server on the internet to mediate between the device at home and the device uh, of the user. I'm not entirely comfortable, I think, with uh, some servers knowing exactly where I am and where everybody is. The only, no, it's not centralized. So the, um, um, maybe the term keep alive is confusing, but so the only thing that's listening for this message is your own device. And that's the only device that knows your code, that's the only device that knows your location. And that doesn't send out anything either. Sorry? Why is already in public IP number on your phone connection? Uh, it's not that's true. Anymore. That's true. That's not entirely standard, but we are working with a situation where you have devices that are also remotely accessible. And some of them go through central service, service right? Like that's how things also go. Um, but some of them do require more local addresses. So that's kind of the, one, you know, one of the options that you have and this works for that. But that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, well, <coughs> what you said about the nothing, I think that uh, every network professional now has to acknowledge that NAT is here to stay. Mm -hmm. In fact, my internet connection is now double netted, well, actually triple netted by now. For you. <laughs> yeah, because my provider does a double net. So um, that's what really? we live in a way yeah. to, to uh, mm -hmm. complete that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. I think you, you were first, I think you were first, right? 
Yeah. Uh, you uh, showed that uh, you have a subnet for every IoT device. Mm -hmm. uh, some IoT devices need to talk to each other or you want multicast. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you work around that? Uh, we do actually allow multicast between the different subnets. And then because of the way that it's set up, it does allow return messages. So it kind of, if there is a communication between two devices that, that rely on each other, um, that does work. Yeah. Or at least so far in testing. I have to say, originally, I, I, um, while I was designing this, this was, you know, 20 years ago, so it was during COVID, I had an agreement with, uh, with the company that uh, they were going to lend me like, a bunch of their IoT devices so I could go and test it on like a bunch of stuff. And then, you know, my deadline was coming up. Like, hey, so like, can we get those devices? and I'm ready for testing. I'm like, yeah, sorry, the, like, the guy with the key to the storage cabinet is gone on holiday. So <laughs> I had to call around all my friends, like, do you have anything that's not a computer that's hooked up to, well, not a normal computer that's hooked up to the internet? Can I borrow it, please? It worked for what we tested, at least. Okay. Yeah. yeah. How do you handle, uh, I see that you um, uh, turn off the DSP server in the, in the router, but then from experience, uh, a lot of ISPs uh, just turn them back on on random moments or uh, you read the <laughs> box at, uh, as soon as a customer complains without even thinking why something is, uh, is changed. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you handle that? Uh, I haven't, it's a good, good question. I haven't considered them turning it on again. That hasn't come up yet. Um, I'll just will do that. Yeah. I, I can't believe that, yeah. Uh, so far, it doesn't. It hasn't seemed to have been a problem. I can't answer conclusively if you know if that would be a problem. It seems like for the most part, devices are just sticking with what they know, uh, and just redirect has also been turned off. It shouldn't be taken over immediately, but yeah. it's a good. It's a good question. Yeah. I think back row first. Yeah. Uh, you said it's open source. Where can we find the source? Sorry. Where can we find the source? The source. Uh, that's a good point. I will put that on the. I will put that on the slides uh, in, a little, in a little bit. Um, in the meantime, maybe another another question. I'll just put yeah. my uh, put just put my GitHub in the in the slides or I GitLab. Think, I think the back there was was still more. I don't more have an internet connection. Yeah. I will. Yeah, uh, we are living in modern times, mm -hmm. uh, and I would say. Uh, uh, some devices will start also switching to uh, IPv6. Is that any thoughts about that again already? Uh, yes, I do have thoughts on IPv6, and it was actually part of my original requirements plan. It's like, yeah. I think I did write, wrote some, write something along the lines of we really should be doing IPv6. I didn't originally get around to it, but it is like part of our, uh, it's part of our, our future pipeline because I do agree it is definitely something we need to have. There you go. Should have didn't shift F five. There you go. There you go. It's set up there. This should be the right URL. I'm able to. I can't check because I don't have internet. But um, this should be it. Last question. How about F eighty six? Yeah, they, they just they just asked. It's it's in the it's in the pipeline. Yeah, I didn't have time for it in the original implementation. Are doing the original prototype, but it is in the in the pipeline. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yes.